before I introduce the really wonderful speakers we have, uh, I do want to just uh, offer a couple of comments about, I think, why and how challenging this topic is. And of course, that's why many of you are here. Um, remembering white supremacy, uh, it implies that a couple of things which are not true. First of all, that people remember white supremacy uh, as a thing in the past, which it is not. The second point I want to begin with is the history of white supremacy has always been revisionist. The monuments that went up were themselves parts of a revisionist historical project. So how we remember the past, really this is a key part of what we want uh, and why we have this convening today. We have uh, three members of the Durham Planning Commission and their purpose was to uh, figure out how um, the Confederate monument that went down recently should be, um, what should happen to it. Our committee was actually a joint city county committee and it was uh, in part uh, convoked by our mayor, Steve Shule, and also by our county commissioners led by the chair of the county commissioners, who's Wendy Jacobs. I just want to um, yeah. yes. In light of the recommendations, if you would break it down, what your process was to reach that top recommendation. Robin and I got together um, immediately. We've known each other for a while and have worked on other reconciliation type things with Greensboro and the Nazi Klan piece many years ago. Um, so one of our, our tenets from the very beginning was to make sure we got as many diverse voices in the process as possible. The committee were five volunteers from the city, five volunteers from the county picked by the county and the city. Uh, Robin and ours only input was really just to say, yeah, it looks like a diverse group of people. Age, gender, you name it. Um, and after that, we discussed where we would literally have them. We wanted to make sure that the process, process again was as open as possible. So we talked about having them at the city and the county so that we would have the ability to do streaming and so forth and there would be uh, also police. Uh, where most of the other uh, meetings were held in primarily uh, public, um, public libraries around Durham County. All of the meetings that were in the city and the county chambers, uh, we did not have the facilitated discussion, like the focus group kind of work. But all of them that were in the community were. And that is really where we gathered the core of our input for making these e uh, final uh, decisions about, or recommendations, let's just say, recommendations about what should be done. I represented the city side. And so I think the thing that stood out for me from the beginning was just the diversity of experience on the committee in terms of the various members. And so there were many different, different perspectives that people brought to bear. And so, you know, for me, just seeing the discussions unfold and noting that there were a few times that got a little tense and I think just watching Charmaine and Robin handle those especially tense moments as a member of the committee, I just you know, will constantly and forever appreciate their leadership because I think that when you get issues that are so fraught with emotion and fraught with a lot of contestation about how we define the central concepts that we're talking about, you know, there's, there's lots of opportunity for things to get out of hand. So they did a really good job of making sure that, that it didn't. I'll just add that um, we made it very clear um, at the very beginning that the job of the committee was not to decide what was right or wrong about how the statute came down. Um, and that, that was, an, I think, an important just point to say to people that we weren't going to argue about that. So I'm going to actually talk about that right now, because <laughs> I've been rolling back a lot. Um, but I would say that one of, the, one of the important framing things about this is that on the one hand, we had a, a North Carolina state law that um, prevents uh, counties or cities or municipalities from um, doing anything to change uh, historical monuments right now. Um, and that was, that's a very limiting factor in, what, in how we discussed what we could potentially do. I mean, we certainly could have said to the city and the county, you know, take it all away. But we would have known um, that uh, that was politically not feasible given the fact that there is a law. Uh, and, and it was passed in 2015 uh, by our General Assembly. 
and um, we got the political, or excuse me, the legal advice that, uh, that Durham was in a kind of an interesting position on this because the law didn't speak to damaged memorials. Um, but uh, it was our sense that neither the city or the county really had the appetite to start a big legal battle. So understanding the political kind of state of play was really important. I think the, the thing I would say about how the statute came down is that um, wh wh whether or not you supported that, what that did was sort of um, short circuit a community discussion about what should be the fate of this statue. And I think one of the things that um, people again and again really appreciated by our process was they got a chance to talk and they knew that they were um, heard. And I think that um, in the end, um, part of the thinking about that first recommendation was that this was a deeply educational process, not only for ourselves as members of the committee, but for the public, which, you know, uh, there, are, there are people on both sides of that issue, or all sides of this issue, that know a lot about it, but I would say the majority of people in Durham County don't know that much about this, and they hadn't really thought about it. And the removal of the statue, again, regardless of what you think about that, did give us a great opportunity to open up some of these issues and to really have a public discussion that was then, I think, um, hopefully helpful. I want to hear a little bit more about um, <coughs> the difficulty in the conversation and what you, what you heard. And if there were a specific <laughs> moment or two that where those conflicts were um, uh, visible and vivid, and maybe describe one of them and how you felt, as well as what you learned. I think we all have stories of sitting at various tables during the various discussions where there were moments you wanted to cringe at some of the things people would say. The most tense moment that stood out was we had someone who came to share, I was calling it testimony, but you know, an expert person who came to, to share her experiences with us. and. She offered some prepared comments, and then the committee would proceed to ask questions of each guest. And so we asked questions, and I think that the guest felt really put upon as a result of the process. I don't know that this is the type of re reaction that she was used to getting from her prepared comments. And so it was really interesting in the aftermath of that discussion to see how various groups interpreted it. So, for example, there were people in the audience who felt that the committee wasn't you know, hard enough on the particular guest or asking uh, questions that were probing enough or, or you know, poignant or pointed enough. And then you had people online who were making comments about how biased we all were and how inappropriate this was. And you know, then there was a blogger somewhere else you know, commenting on how the committee really had failed its duty in inviting that particular guest and asking those softball questions. So it was really interesting you know, how political that interpretation could, have, could, could be and was throughout the process. We happened to be at the, the South Library, which is near Highway 55 and 54 on Old Fayetteville Road. And whenever we would go into the libraries, Robin and I would just make sure we would uh, tell security that was there, you know, who we were and that this might be, you know, very passionate or committed. Just in case, I saw a young man come in, a, a, a young white man come in, and he had on a shirt that had a small Confederate flag on the shirt. Okay? No problem. Um, then I actually saw him turn around when I was speaking and sit down, and he had a bigger one on the back of his shirt. <laughs> And it said, you know, the classic, it's not about race, it's about heritage. Okay, no problem. So we started the process of breaking into our facilitated discussions. I think that night we had about five different tables, about 10 people each table, something of that nature. And um, this young man proceeded to pull something out of his pocket. I was a little concerned about the pocket issue, but it was not a gun, it was not a weapon at all, thank goodness. It was a small wooden piece which he set on the table, and we then figured out there was a small Confederate flag to come to sit in the base, you know, about six inches. People were hardly mumbling about the shirt. I mean, what he said to me, which was actually funny at the end of the day, but I couldn't laugh either. I have this here representing the black soldiers during the Confederacy. 
It was very nice. I said, well, no one else at the table has any other remembrances, so we need for your remembrance to be put away. And we still would love for you to stay and have discussion. He got mad, gonna report you, gonna report you, blah. I asked him three times. I said, okay, well now I've asked you nicely three times. You've left me no choice but to go get security. Okay. I go get security. The good part was they convinced him after about 15, 20 minutes to put it in his car. He came back and went on with the entire facilitated discussion. This is actually speaks to the experiential part you just have raised, but how did your views of the monument change? Or, and did they? Um, I think it was the second um, meeting that we had when we had Fitz Brundage come, who's mm -hmm. a UNC history professor who's done a lot of work on this. And I asked him a question, um, did he see a difference between a monument to say Robert E. Lee or Jeff Stewart or um, you know, any of the sort of Confederate uh, you know, leaders, heroes, did he see a difference between that kind of a monument and a monument like Durham's, which is to the common soldier, right? And is there, when you're talking about these monuments representing white supremacy, is there a sort of gradation of difference? Um, and he said no. But that really stuck with me because I, I kind of kept thinking, well, wait a second. Um, you're talking about you know, uh, a monument honoring uh, young men, for the most part, who were not necessarily slave owners and who were conscripted and who died in a war. And if we're adjudicating monuments to stupid wars, <laughs> there are a lot of stupid wars that we have monuments to that aren't this conflictive. So I, I just kept thinking about that. And one of the members of our committee um, uh, is a, a reenactor and a member of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. He and his unit will be called um, by the Department of Transportation in North Carolina to come to recover the remains of soldiers if there are building projects, say a highway or a, or a building or whatever, and that they will go in their reenactment uniforms, um, and sometimes they'll be mixed units, Confederate and Union, union reenactors, and they'll go and actually recover the remains of these young men and reinter them in another place. And, and I realized that that connection to the dead is something that I have not felt, but that he felt very strongly because he literally goes to these places and takes these remains with his colleagues and, and then reburies them with some sort of you know, sense of reverence and honor. And I guess that shifted my thinking, not about the white supremacy part of the monument, but about how some people feel about the monument. And I think um, Deandra was kind of alluding to this in her comment, that the level of emotion, which is not factual, it's not you know, grounded in historical fact, but it's been cultivated over many generations in, within families. You know, people came with an enormous amount of emotion, on, you know, again, on all sides of this, that really wasn't something that you could argue against with facts. What can we do that respects the people who at least feel this dedication not to the cause of the Civil War, not to the people who led the Civil War, but to the young men who, whose lives were squandered. The, the, the person who represented the Sons of Confederacy. Uh, we sat beside each other a couple of times in those months and actually became friends. And um, near the end when we were compiling our report, um, I suggested I call him to <coughs> make sure we were all on the same page on a couple of issues. His perspective had shifted a little bit too. I think we both gained a level of respect for each other's opinion. Did not necessarily change our opinion, but I, I did at least understand where he was coming from and his reverence for his fallen family members. The bottom line came down. I said, now you know we all agree that we will deal with facts. And one of the issues was Julian Carr was a member of the KKK. And at the end of the day, he said, that is this factual statement. It needs to stay. And there were several other issues, but I think we both had come a little closer to each other's perspectives. Not I didn't change my mind, <laughs> but I valued his opinion at this point. And I think he valued mine 
And uh, we walked away saying we would probably be friends. You know, as a student of history, so much is irreconcilable still about the Civil War, about why it was fought, about really whose sacrifices mattered. So I'm wondering about the process of truth and reconciliation and how you think the monument in its current state can actually create some reconciliation. I think reconciliation is, is a multi-generational process. That when we try to, um, when we think of reconciliation as something that happens um, even even within a single generation, it's just it, it, I don't know of any country in the world where that has actually happened. Our very own history is not talked about and is not taught and is not kind of in our bloodstream the way you know George Washington the cherry tree is. So I, I think that part of reconciliation for me is is also a better a, a more robust commitment to to telling the whole story. I always quote Pauli Murray: "It's telling the whole story of the past." not only the dignity but the degradation of the past, that you have to tell it all. We're very much oriented toward individuals, and I think that our capacity to reconcile our contemporary goals and aspirations with our history requires that we think more collectively and more consistently. And I think that goes back to what Robin says about achieving a more holistic, round and inclusive sense of history and understanding of history, but then also a commitment to a more inclusive uh, politics in the future. You know, this process really gave some valuable insights into the politics of space and the politics of public mm -hmm. celebration. And historically, we've really been fairly narrow in who we celebrate and who has access to our public spaces and the power of that, of that possession. And so if we really want to move forward, people who have enjoyed a lot of that power historically are going to have to cede some of it. And I think that's difficult. You know, there is a redistributive element to this that is politically difficult. I have this issue frequently. You and I talked a little bit before we started about some of my memories and my siblings' memories of being some of the first to integrate Durham Public Schools. They're not happy stories. And so I get a lot of, well, why do you want to go back there and tell that? Well, you know, you can't go forward without telling all of the truth. Yeah, two black students integrated Durham High School in 1959, and they graduated in June of 1960. But in between, my sister got knocked down the steps, left to got beat up, basically. And the only person that helped her were the black folks that worked at Durham High School at the time. It, it does concern me that when we want to tell the truth, we just want to tell a portion of the truth. And without having all of the stories, um, we're missing an ability to move forward in a more positive way. Why do you think the statue came down when it did? Or like, what other factors do you think were in play that allowed the statue to come down a year ago and not any like earlier than that? This is actually um, goes back further to um, Charleston and the killing of the worshipers in the in the church, and and there actually has been a lot of uh, protest around Confederate statues before then. An unavoidable factor is the election of this president to um, the White House, and I think that has, and, and along with the passage of the law. <laughs> Um, in the General Assembly in 2015, which essentially um, prevented municipalities from making their own decisions. Um, you know, it's uh, often people would say, oh, you're erasing the past, you're, you're erasing history by taking down these monuments. And, you know, the monuments are not history. They mm -hmm. are a veneration of a certain idea. Um, but at the same time, people uh, take monuments down all the time. You know, from the ancient Egyptians until now, monuments are switched out all the time. So it's not unusual to think about, you know, does a city or a county want a, a different sort of representation of its values? Essentially, the monuments are values. So um, the um, effort to take down the statues was really energized um, by these hor horrific violent acts, but also the particular political moment that both handcuffed our elected officials uh, mm -hmm. who couldn't do anything, and also gave, um, you know, made this issue really come to the forefront. I don't know if you... you also have to remember that the President of the United States did say, they're good people, 
on both sides in Charlottesville. Uh, that was a powerful statement for me. I have not forgotten it, and I believe that was an impetus for pulling the one down in Durham. We talked a fair amount about the Bennett Place Monument, the Unity Monument. Bennett Place is where the last and biggest surrender of the Civil War took place. So in 1923, um, Durham put up a monument to Unity. And so it's got one pillar that's the Confederacy, one pillar that's the Union, and the idea is that it's a peace, a monument to peace. That monument has never been controversial. Um, a year later, the Durham Monument goes up, or Durham, they start to fundraise for the Durham Monument. And the, the, the little dirty secret of that monument is that people didn't support it even then. Not black people, not white people. Um, it was the Daughters of the Confederacy, named for Julian Carr, were fundraising for this memorial, and they could not raise enough money, because nobody wanted it. And so they finally convinced the legislature to levy a one-time only tax on Durham residents to pay for this statue. So it is the only statue, one of the only Confederate statues in the United States that's actually paid for with public money. We've also yes. lost that history of Durham, not only Durham people not supporting it at the time, white people not supporting it at the time, but black people were forced to pay for it through taxes at a time when they, for the most part, could not vote. Part of what we're hoping with yep. this pretty revolutionary idea that you display the damaged statue is that that history also be a part of it. I just had a question about the reasoning behind the first recommendation and putting the display in a building near the original location of the statue rather than like a museum, for example. Well, part of it goes back to the 2015 um, Governor McCory I call it that, but the legislature put into place about, so th I'm, I'm grappling with something to the effect of a uh, similar place of uh, historical significance or mm. something like that. In other words, if you're going to take them down, you got to put them up somewhere. In front of a courthouse, how do you duplicate that, really? You know, it's similar. Part of our, our point is that we see him in the state he's in now and how and why he was brought down the same way we're leaving the base and we contextualize that and say how that got there. So I was wondering um, what the committee was doing or thinking about doing in terms of decreasing the apathy towards the problem and bringing in more people who previously were like, this is not my problem, this may not be my problem because I don't live here originally or because it's not going to affect me in my personal life, to just kind of get everyone to feel the same emotion as the people who are going to the committee meetings, going to protesting and all that stuff? I, I don't know. I mean, I think that that's a, that's a challenge yeah. um, to get people to care. I, and I think, you know, I hope that, you know, people, you know, if they want to come to see the statue in a new location, if it's there. One of the recommendations that's not up here is that we also um, recommended that the county and city add because we can't do anything about the, the, the base right now because of the law. So um, what we advocated is that the, the, our public officials add uh, uh, another installation that would be to union veterans. This was a, a union area, the Piedmont. Um, so many, many young men, instead of joining the Confederacy, joined the union, and in particular, African-American fighters, even Northerners who would, who would then move to North Carolina. And then we would have a third pillar that would be to enslave people, to say, look, they were also part of this story, part of this history. And I think the fourth one we wanted was uh, to women and children who suffered during the war. So the idea would be to expand the way we talk about the Civil War. But your question about how we get people engaged in this is, is a hard one. Just to add to that was, but we did have great involvement in all of our meetings. Um, I'm not sure if we had as many young people as we would have liked. What do you do when it's like emotions versus fact? Do you continue to separate the two? Do you try to reconcile them, mix them together? How do you approach it? I feel like I, I tend to operate less in emotions, and that gets me in trouble. Because sometimes, especially when we're talking about history and issues that are politically sensitive, you know, you could be just, you know, rattling off what you think is rational and factual, 
and really stumble into something that is, you know, on the border, if not um, completely disrespectful, because you're not being careful of people's feelings and emotions about things. So I think for me, just understanding sort of what your, where you tend to operate, and being mindful of what you might need to do to approach those types of conversations in a way that's generative. And so for me, that's being more uh, in tune to the other people in the room and to their emotions and to do more listening. In the era, era of fake news and alternative facts, what role does truth play, especially when you need to take into account people's perceptions? So if there is one thing that is truth, perception is relative, but it doesn't matter. Like, the truth is the truth. But now we're living in a country where truth is relative to whoever's consuming it. So how do you go about looking at issues like um, white supremacy and um, Confederate statues and racial bias and institutional racism and things of that nature when you can have 400 million different perceptions of what that actually is. That was one of the biggest challenges of engaging in these discussions over the last few months because people came to the table, I think there were, I think many people already had a bit of, um, there was a bit of a guard up or maybe a chip on some shoulders because they felt like they were already misunderstood going into the conversations. And their version of the facts was very different from what they expected to encounter um, within the context of our conversations. Beyond much of what I've learned throughout this process, it's been just this real, disappointment with how I was taught history in the early years. And part of it is, you know, when you sit and you actually read through the congressional record and you read through actual speeches and you understand what, you know, what really was going on back in 1865, and, and you compare that to some of what people come to the table thinking based on, you know, discussions within a family or family lore. And so I think that one way to achieve that is, of course, to strengthen how we teach civics and history, but then also to, to provide people with opportunities as early as possible to dialogue with people who are completely different from them. Because I feel like there's something, there's sort of a give and take there where maybe you would have to question what you receive, the sort of received wisdom from your family, from the people you trust the most, you know, who you started your life with. and it might be easier to do that if you have deep relationships with people who are bringing different histories to bear to those discussions. So I don't know, I don't think this will be easy. You know, I think that to get people on the same page in terms of what quote unquote truth is, is tough. I think in the context of our discussions with the committee, the things that we tried to do was to provide as much evidence as possible and to provide as much insight from experts as possible. And I think that was know, what, what sort of carried the day in this particular instance, but in terms of the broader objective of moving toward a shared truth, I think it'll take um, just a lot, of, a lot of evidence and a lot of, of reshaping how we teach and treat history. How much did Durham being a liberal hub play into this? Um, how, would it, how would you guys think it would have looked if you were in a more rural area of North Carolina? And then last question, um, how slash would these recommendations look different? A rural community versus an urban community like this, I think it'd be very, very different. Have we lived in rural communities? Basic things such as, I mean, we talked about having them in a variety of locations. Physically getting people to a destination would have been more problematic. I mean, it's like you have a school bus or something, okay? Same kind of thing. Uh, access to Wi-Fi and streaming, <laughs> that would have been an issue in many, many rural communities. So I think it would have been a really different process. I think we would have had to think a little bit harder um, because geographically, in a rural community, that is part of the problem, getting people to and from a destination, okay? Because there is no public transportation. All right. um, and because we are, I'll take your word for it, Slightly liberal, if you're on your own. 
we did get a lot of diverse voices. But I'll say, I think the diversity, a lot of it came not just race, but age. I did see that the older or the younger, you know, there was a definitely diverging perspectives with, within age, as opposed to gender, or as opposed to some of the concerns, okay? Um, so ha having the difference between urban and rural, I don't know if we would have ever come to all of these decisions. I think it would have been, um, we, we wouldn't have gotten the, the diverse forces. I'm not sure where we would have even had the level of participation at the variety of meetings. Um, again, I've worked in rural communities, so I know some of the concerns that are there. Um, and because we had a lot of people with a lot of different backgrounds and the 10 individuals and then Robin and I as co-chairs, um, their diversity within itself, we probably would have never found also in a rural community. Let me um, thank you for your questions, your comments, your reflections, and especially thank um, um, Charmaine, Deandra, and Robin for their wisdom, experience. Thank you.